So welcome everybody to our session here at the Berlin Science Week on behalf of the ETH Zurich, that's the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. Um, we are here to present to you um, how science can, can work in the service of humanitarian aid, and the, the title of our session is Rethinking Humanitarian Aid. We will have three case studies that we will show to you of work that we're doing, um, and it will uh, be followed by a panel discussion with our panelists, who I will introduce shortly. Can everybody hear me? Is the audio working? Yes, I will continue. So, um, rethinking humanitarian aid, specifically with the help of scientific knowledge and scientific methods. But let me begin and introduce our session by explaining the work, the exact type of work that is being done in, human, in the humanitarian sector and what we fo focus on. So of course, all of you are familiar with it from the media. Let me make it more specific. Humanitarian work helps people, oops, helps people affected by crisis. So it's about people. And so you will see scenes like these. These are all photographs from MEDAIR, a specific organization. But this is typical of work that's being done by many organizations you've heard of before. So what we're seeing here um, are, are scenes from uh, migrant camps and, and uh, health clinics and so on. Humanitarian assistance is about saving lives first and foremost. It's about alleviating suffering. It's about relief and recovery during and after man-made crises and natural disasters. And it's also about preventing and strengthening pre uh, preparedness for when such situations occur. It's not always just reactive, it is proactive. And of course, it's about caring for the most needy and vulnerable people in the world today maintaining human dignity. I want to become more specific before we start talking about how science plays a role in, in this. So there, there are very typical types of programs that are delivered by humanitarian organizations. Um, there is uh, medical programs in which, uh, of course, clinics are run and medical care is provided. Um, so the humanitarian workers are providing uh, nutrition, they're providing health care, um, and counseling. The second type of program is called WASH, in which wa water and sanitary um, uh, facilities are provided for people in need. The specific type of work that is, that is uh, executed there are wells being drilled, boreholes, uh, the construction of latrines, which is closely related, of course, to the medical care, because sanitary conditions are essential for good health and today in our times of pandemic, also providing hand washing facilities. And then um, there are shelter programs in which, in which, yeah, exactly that shelter is provided for people who are exposed to the elements as a result of natural disasters. That means building homes, building temporary shelters, tents, um, also disaster proof homes. It, is, it includes the distribution of non-food items like blankets and uh, tarpaulins and so on. This can also include repairing or creating infrastructure um, for, for the delivery of the items. In addition to these three principal types of program, meaning medical, uh, uh, wash, and shelter, uh, humanitarian work um, involves education, peace building, and protection. You've heard of some of these things through the new news, but um, when we talk about the programs that we support, it is specifically about making these this work more effective and efficient. All of this work takes place in a completely different context from what we know in our civilian lives. So the, the context of humanitarian work is particularly challenging, as we can imagine. So it happens at a time of crisis. Um, it usually strikes uh, regions that are suffering from poverty to begin with. So if a disaster, if, if an earthquake strikes in Japan, it may not become a humanitarian case simply because um, of the, the resource richness that, that exists and the, the institutional robustness of the context. Uh, humanitarian work takes place in poverty-stricken regions where res where that are resource poor and where the, the institutions are not as strong. Of course, we, we struggle, or, or the, the aid workers struggle with corruption, with chaos, and, and conflict and, and violence. Um, 
This results in limited access to the people in need. So you can't just go there. The challenges to actually getting the work done means first establishing access, a huge challenge. Um, the people that we work with uh, or the, the beneficiaries there may not have the education that it, the educational levels that exist um, in richer parts of the world, not for en out of any fault of their own, but places that are that are stricken by by chaos and by conflict tend to have low infrastructure for educating the population. This is a challenge for aid workers who are trying to function there. Infrastructure is often destroyed or simply does not exist. And of course, there are environmental challenges. So before we start talking about the solutions that science can provide here uh, and, and support in the work, uh, I want to give you an overview of why um, we, we even have to see the moral imperative for this work to improve. Um, contrary to what uh, many of us might think when we hear media campaigns to please contribute um, to, uh, uh, to humanitarian efforts to, uh, in, in times of crisis, when an earthquake occurs or when there is, is conflict and crisis in a region, uh, humanitarian funding in the world as a whole has been steadily increasing in the past decades. So we're talking about a huge amount of resources being poured into the humanitarian sector. Um, and uh, the, first, uh, the first graph that you see here comes from a publication by Professor Carbonier, who is the Vice President of the International Red Cross. And he is actually starting up the field of humanitarian economics simply on the premise that the amount of money going into the system is increasing dramatically um, over time. And here you can see another picture that goes a little bit further. I don't have data from the last seven years, but you clearly see the trend. Uh, emergency funding has risen tenfold in the last 14 years. So any impression you've had that there is no money uh, going into these projects, it's simply not true. Um, that doesn't mean that the challenges do not exist. So let me try and explain to that. The biggest donors are not you and me. They're not private people who are opening their purses. These are institutional donors. These are nations. And you can see an overview right here. Nevertheless, the good, if the good news that is that, that more money is being directed to need in the world, the bad news is that it's simply not enough because the need is growing faster than the resources um, are being provided for that. So if you see here um, the data from UNOCHA, um, the people in need are, are, are shown in, in red in 2021. That's 235 million people in need but funding um, has been targeted for um, much less than that, than that number, 159 million this year. So there is, um, there is a difference. Uh, and we've seen it growing over time, as the trend will show. So 79% more people in 2021 than, than 2019. This is, um, this is obviously a great deal of pressure in the system, even as the resources poured in increase. So you, we talk about uh, a funding gap. Uh, we face a dilemma because uh, the work is increasing um, exactly at this pace. The resources are increasing, but not enough. So the needs are growing. Uh, the needs are, are, are bigger than, than um, the, the funding that's going in there. So what are the things that we can do faced with exactly this dilemma? So um, the speakers here today, the ETH and its Humanitarian Operations and Supply Chain Management Lab, uh, the other lab that will be presented here today, the, uh, the, the scientific work is addressing exactly this gap and this dilemma. We come to the conclusion that there are only three things you can do if you have a funding gap and you have increasing need in the world. You can either reduce the need. Uh, politicians are working very hard. Uh, to do this. So nevertheless, if you look at cases like South Sudan, where humanitarian organizations have had missions there for over 30 years, they're basically a permanent uh, fixture in, in countries like this. Reducing the need will not happen quickly, and it may never happen at all. Um, there are many success stories in humanitarian aid. Doesn't mean uh, we really have the influence over the original need. We don't see that as the most promising um, uh, initiative, although we should not stop trying. Uh, we can increase the funding by all means. 
and uh, Dr. Paris will talk about that later. If you have a system that's inefficient, our experience as industrial engineers is that pumping in more resources does not improve outcomes. And that's what we will be uh, showing today in more detail. Our attempt or our uh, strategy for this is to make the money we have go further. Um, we are uh, supply chain management engineers. Um, and so one of the things that, one of the ways that we describe our work is saying doing more with less. So this is what uh, we will describe today. Here are our three speakers. Uh, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Lea Rush, who will finish her doctorate. I, I'd like to call her Dr. Rush, but legally I'm not allowed to, but she will finish her doctorate um, in February. Um, she is actually not an industrial engineer, but she used scientific methods as a psychologist to support uh, more productivity in organizations. She targets better behavior to make the work better. So she will be showing you in detail how to measure and model the behaviors of people and then testing these effects to improve leadership. Um, so Leah will be our first speaker. Our second speaker will be Dr. Andrew Paris. He's Process Excellence Manager at Medair, a small NGO in uh, Switzerland, uh, close to Geneva, um, and he will be talking about improving the system of work itself. I, I described the three, three types of programs. Now, um, what could we do to make uh, the work that goes into um, delivering health care or, or, or providing uh, clean water, how could we reduce waste in the work that is done there? And he will show you how an industrial method um, targets exactly this, and it has a very very, very interesting uh, team and uh, an organizational effect. Um, team productivity and, and, uh, and the behavior and the, uh, the interpersonal behavior improves as uh, the work processes become uh, less wasteful and, and um, uh, uh, less convoluted. So uh, it's also a way of improving team engagement, which is very important, obviously. And I will close with a, a final uh, presentation, very brief, that is very timely today. And this is not, uh, strictly speaking, a humanitarian crisis, but we are working in a resource-poor environment to improve preparedness for epidemic response in Uganda, I will give you um, a quick overview of what that project is doing, which is, uh, of course, of, of, of personal interest to us all because the world is embroiled in a pandemic. And so it's about getting medical supply to the right place at the right time to respond to, um, to sudden pandemics. And with that, I'm sorry if that introduction was a little bit fast. We have a lot to present to you today. And I'd like to pass uh, on to our first speaker, Lea Rush. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you very much for introducing me and hello also from my side. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk about our work today, which is about the human element in humanitarian operations. So during the refugee crisis, the peak of the refugee crisis in 2015, there was over a million of people in need. Luckily, though, there were also thousands of people out there really motivated and ready to help. And back then, that made me curious. Back then, I was a student in organizational psychology, and I was wondering, how can we make this work? How can we use this powerful movement in order to make humanitarian aid more effective? So I reached out to aid workers as well as to researchers and asked them, what do you think, what do, you, what, what do we need in order to make humanitarian aid as a whole more effective? And they said, we have to cooperate better. So what did they mean by that? So when a disaster strikes, there are hundreds of organizations out there in order to help. And this picture here is only a small excerpt of the total humanitarian landscape. So all these organizations are trying to help, however, what they are facing is restricted funding. So in this figure by the United Nations author, you see that almost half of what was required by the humanitarian sector was ultimately not delivered to it. And that's why the United Nations um, calls in their sustainable development goal for better partnerships for global development. To improve partnerships, the United Nations itself set up the cluster system. And this resonates also with 
research and what research tells us. So research in humanitarian operations basically says we need clusters, so that means we need coordination platforms where representatives from humanitarian organizations can meet and coordinate with each other. And we furthermore need a cluster lead, so an organization and persons coordinating this information exchange and resource exchange between the organizations. And this is reflected in practice. So over a decade ago, the cluster system by the United Nations was set up, which comprises different sections for humanitarian aid. For instance, food, nutrition, shelter, as well as logistics. And each cluster is hosted by a cluster lead. So what the, cl the cluster lead does is it organizes regular meetings in the field in affected regions, as well as on a global level, where representatives from humanitarian organizations are coming together in order to exchange resources with each other. And by resources, I mean information as well as material resources needed in order to tackle the humanitarian response. And by political mandate, this cluster lead um, also functions as the last resort. So that means in case there are striking resource gaps, so we already alluded to this, there are striking resource gaps. So imagine the scenario, there is an organization that needs certain material resources, such as trucks, in order to bring their relief items to an affected region, and they do not have these resources. Then the cluster lead has to come in and provide these resources. So what you see is the whole system is in place. We have a system that properly works and is there in order to facilitate coordination. However, what we see is that coordination is still one of the biggest challenges to successful humanitarian aid. So the earthquake in Haiti in 2010 was one striking example where coordination between all these aid actors didn't really work out. And it even became labeled as a as a huge failure in, in uh, scientific case studies. And that led me then specifically to the question, well, how can that be? Why is cooperation still so difficult, even though there is a system in place that is there to facilitate coordination? So there may be something in it, perhaps the human element, that is driving the difficulties shaping cooperation. So and in our research, that is, doesn't come as a surprise, because I'm an organizational psychologist, I wanted to examine how the humans in the system working for humanitarian organizations and in aid teams, how they shape humanitarian aid as a whole, operations outcomes. And by operations, I mean tangible, tangible numbers, everything that is measurable. Basically, how many beneficiaries were served and, and received help and how efficiently and effectively did they receive this help. So this is the approach of my research. So and now I will show you the specific studies that we conducted um, during my PhD, my team from the Kühne Logistics University and I. So we set up a research institute that is um, called um, Reloa. So if you find this interesting, you, you can also go on our website and see the studies that our team is um, conducting. So one of these studies is um, focused on the cluster system. So here our research question was, what kind of leadership styles does the cluster need in order to be successful? And here we first reached out to the people working in the system, because I wanted to give voice to them and let them speak and let them share their experiences that they made in the field and in these cluster meetings. So I specifically asked them, why is coordination so difficult and what do we need in order to improve it? Well, and what we found is what they were saying, the system is great and they highly appreciate it, However, at the same time, they often face these power struggles in the system, which may be, at the first sight, contradicting, contradicting humanitarian aid as such, because we would think they all have the same objective. Of course, they, they want to cooperate to make it happen. However, what, what we find is, due to these restricted resources, 
the eight actors finding themselves in power struggles. So when they then come to these meetings in the field where resources, financial resources, logistics resources are allocated, then they of course also want to benefit from this resource allocation to make their response happen. If they then feel we are not getting what we want, then it's upsetting for them. This is human. So they do not get what they want, and this, even, so this feeling, this anger, becomes even worse if they are observing that the cluster lead itself has two heads. So let me explain what I mean by the cluster lead having two heads. So what sometimes happens is that the cluster lead coordinating these meetings by mandate and also by mandate being responsible to provide the missing resources often runs operations itself. So that is, the cluster lead may sometimes have an interest itself to benefit from these meetings and thereby also prioritizing its own needs as opposed to cluster members' needs. And this is upsetting for the cluster and decreases trust among the cluster members in, in, in the whole approach. On a positive note, though, they were also sharing scenarios where coordination works really well. And here they described a pure facilitator approach of the cluster lead. That means a cluster lead that does not run any operations and that, on top, serves a neutral agenda, so neutrally allocating the resources to the cluster members. So in another study, we were checking what kind of communication styles can help to improve the information sharing between humanitarian actors as well as the public. And here we use social media data because especially to the pandemic where we all found ourselves in remote realities, social media became an even, an even more important uh, communications means. So here we were asking, are there specific communication styles that improve the information diffusion of actional advice, what should be done and what shouldn't be done um, during, during the pandemic? And here we distinguished two specific communication styles um, that we inferred from communication guidelines, such as the guideline by the World Health Organization. So this word, the World Health Organization and other scientists called for authentic communication. So experts, such as humanitarian aid workers, they should communicate authentically what can be done or what cannot be done. So certainty also as well as uncertainty. But at the same time, they should also signal confidence so that we can make it happen. So then um, scraping the social media data and using quantitative text mining methods as well as multi, um, statistical analyses, but I do not mean to bore anybody with that and to become too nerdy in that regard. However, so what we found here, and that may be interesting, is that confidence during such precari precarious times as the pandemic may not be as important as authenticity. So we found that authent authentic communication is actually uh, really driving the information sharing and information diffusion of actual advice during uh, aid workers as well as the public. So in the last study I would like to um, show you today is um, also a social media study. And here we measured over th two years to what extent humanitarian organizations actually cross-promote each other in social media. And what we find is that the cross-promotion, unfortunately, is still quite low. However, we also find that some groups cooperate more with each other than others. And these are those, so the institutionally funded organizations, so those that get the funding from the institutional donors, those are the ones cross-promoting each other. However, we found that the privately funded organizations may be a little bit more competitive in the, that regard and not cross-promoting um, other privately funded organizations or institutionally funded organizations. So these dynamics um, speak to, so we, try, we, we made the inference that the type of funding may create certain identities. These organizations feel identities, identification between a certain type of organization that then also drives their cooperation. Thank you for your attention and now I would like to hand over to 
Andrew. All right, thank you very much. Um, all right, so uh, my name is Andrew Paris again, Process Excellence Manager at METER, a humanitarian NGO based near Lausanne in Switzerland. And I guess it's up to me to get there. There we go. All right, so I want to talk about um, improving the system of work. And in fact, we talked about there are a couple of things we can do. We can reduce the need, we can increase the funding, or we can make the money go farther. And, we, and what I'm going to talk about is reducing the system of work through something called lean. Uh, some of you might ask the question, well, what is lean? We'll talk about that. So most of the private sector, many parts of the public sector are f very familiar with what lean is. Um, it's what enabled Toyota to, re to become the leading car company in the world. It's also what Google, Amazon, and you can see a number of uh, companies who are famous for doing lean um, have done to grow their market share, grow their profits, empower their people also. Um, specifically, um, according to the Lean Enterprise Institute, there's uh, this definition of lean that it is a way of thinking about creating needed value with fewer resources and less waste. It's also a pra set of practices consisting of continuous experimentation, and that's where the scientific part comes in, um, in order to achieve perfect value with zero waste. So to rephrase these a little bit, we could say lean empowers and expects people to improve how they do their work through, through the scientific method, we'll talk about that more, of continuous improvement in order to reduce waste and increase value, the value that a company provides to its customers, or in the case of humanitarian work, to the people in need, the people who are in crisis, whom we're serving. Lean also has the double benefit of reducing the burden on people. Uh, it's, it's a very heavy load to not have enough resources and have so many needs out there, um, and to have so many crises that are coming our way. We talked uh, initially about some of the challenges that we face in the humanitarian context. Um, this will help reduce the burden because we're not running, o stepping over our own toes in order to get the work done. So we're reducing the burden on employees, promoting their creativity, and also learning within the organization. So what is the scientific part of Lean? It's basically this, 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 uh, this way of formulating a hypothesis about what will work and then testing to see if that hypothesis works. This is the famous plan, do, check, act cycle that was developed by Edwards Deming. And then the plan part of it, basically what one does is define the problem. The problem is the gap between where we are and where we want to be. Uh, the number of people with, with f food that they can get daily easily, uh, for example, the number of children uh, suffering from malaria or whatever the case may be. Um, but we're also looking at this now inter internally to the organization. We define the problem. Maybe it takes us too long to get our, our, our humanitarian supply chain needs in order to deliver them to people. Maybe it takes us too long to hire people, etc. We measure the, the way things are currently happening. We analyze it, understand the root causes, and then we put a plan together for how to act, when to act, who's going to do what, all those things we normally do in our planning, and then we implement. We do, we make the change. And too often, what often happens is people will stop there and say, okay, let's keep going. But the scientific method in insists that what we do is we measure it. We check to see, did we make a difference? And if not, we're going to go back around to <laughs> in the backwards direction. If, if we did get what we wanted to achieve, then we go forward, we act, and we, we incorporate the, the new learning, and we, we move forward with the new way of doing things. So this is our scientific approach of Lean, which we want to consider. How does this work in humanitarian operations? Um, humanitarians love Toyota vehicles. They are reliable, they are tough, they go the distance, they don't need much repair. Um, but does this system, and Lean comes from Toyota, Toyota production system, does the system that was developed by Lean also work? Okay, their cars work, but does their management system work in NGOs? That's the question that maybe this young man is thinking about. Um, so we can ask the question, what could the impact of Lean be in an NGO? Well, I'll share with you some experience now. Um, 
And the simple answer, it's similar to what it is in the corporate world. If anyone's familiar with, with, uh, with the uh, changes, impacts, 40% reduction of this, 50% reduction of that, it's a similar type of a thing. So I spent some time with World Vision, another large international NGO, uh, living in uh, East Africa, working and training uh, my colleagues there in Lean, Lean Six Sigma concepts. And things that we were able to do is to reduce over a million and a half dollars annually in supply chain costs mostly, reduce the span time, the time it takes to do things. For example, in, in uh, processes where we target it, we reduced almost 60% of, of the time it takes to do certain things. And we also began to develop a culture of continuous improvement, just getting people thinking about making small changes a little bit here, a little bit there every day. Some specific examples, I won't go through them, but you can see Similar to what one finds in the corporate world, not surprisingly, uh, processes are, are, have, have a number of similarities, 40, 50 percent improvements, 80 percent improvements um, in, in various processes that we took on. So we can get these uh, similar results. Also, what can be the impact? So in Medar, the NGO that I currently work, work in, we've also realized significant improvements. Um, I want to point out in particular a case study um, that uh, Bubla and I documented on the meta response to the, uh, <coughs> to the uh, Beirut blast back in August 4th of last year. And the ability of people to respond quickly, to adapt on the ground, the leadership, communication practices, etc., were really instrumental in empowering and enabling meta to have a great response. So uh, that's the... Uh, uh, some reference on that. Now, one might ask the question, okay, Andrew, you've told us about this thing called Lean. What's so new about Lean? These are some gentlemen who are kind of the founding fathers of Lean. Uh, in fact, there's nothing new about Lean. It's been around for 30 to 70 years, depending on, on when you, about 30 years ago when the term Lean was coined, but, but before that it was a Toyota thing. Um, but ver And Lean now is applied in virtually every Every sector, every, every industry, in governments, militaries even are applying lean. Um, it is a proven approach to continuously improving in the pursuit of excellence. So that's not the new part. Then the, the question is, well, what is the new part? Well, the new part is to apply this in NGOs, in the, work, in the humanitarian work. That's the thing that's new. Um, we recently did a, a, a very brief informal survey of a number of uh, leaders in humanitarian organizations asking the question, do you know anything about lean? And uh, how much do you know about lean? And 87% responded, we know little to nothing about lean. None of them said we know how to do it well enough to teach anyone else. Um, but on the other hand, 61% said, we would like to benefit from lean. This sounds interesting, but we don't know where to start. 22% have begun, but still are novices, and nobody says they're, in, they're good at it or, again, could, could, uh, uh, are experts in, in the process. But there's an opportunity here where we could light the fuse and, and get this rocket going if we can apply lean and really have dramatic impact in the humanitarian sector and development sectors as well. So there's an irony, and this, and this is the irony um, development and humanitarian principles are very similar to lean principles. So let's go through a couple of these and, <clears throat> um, and we'll go through them now. So the first fundamental thing that you learn about when you're going to do development work or humanitarian work is you need to show respect you, for the people. You treat the people you're serving with dignity and you are there to serve them, not to tell them what to do. You're not there to... Uh, to you are there to provide value to them. You're not there to tell them what to do. You're not there to do things for them. Uh, the people who are in need are the people who are experts in being in, in, in poverty or in, in, the, in the crisis. They know what the problems are. They often know what the solutions are. We need to ask them. We need to involve them. We need to work with them. Um, in, in humanitarian work, in development work, we're also trained to do things as simply as, and easy as visually as possible. And it's a great uh, picture here of, of a uh, mid-upper arm uh, measurement for, for malnutrition. 
Um, it's a color-coded, very simple technique that almost anyone with a little bit of training can do. It's, it's a simple approach, and, and that's one of the, the concepts of Lean, interestingly. Um, we build people up. We build people up in order to empower them to, to make their lives better. And in, inside of an organization, we want to build up employees to make their processes better, to make their work better. And there's this last point here. Create plan, as we talked about, experiment and monitor the outputs, monitor the impact that we're having. This is what NGOs do day in and day out. They monitor, they evaluate, and the cycle, they do that again and again to see, is the intervention working? Are we having the desired impact? So the irony is, NGOs aren't doing this in their own work. They're not applying the principles that they apply in the field in their own operations. But at the same time, it's not just irony, it's also an opportunity. Because, and I have found this to be truly the case, NGOs will also more readily understand and accept and, and be able to say, yeah, this lean thing, this makes sense once they hear about it. Because it is so familiar to them, it is something that is natural to them. Um, so the novelty, where is the novelty? The novelty is in applying scientific thinking to the humanitarian operations, not just to, to the uh, field work that we do and seeing if the, what we're doing is having an impact. It's in applying a proven private sector, corporate world approach management system inside the NGO world, which, which is often nervous about these types of things. Um, it's also in applying development and humanitarian principles, again, inside the organization, not just outside the organization in the work that we do. And it's about empowering and expecting employees to improve. We're, we're building the capacity of our employees to improve how they do their work, and we're expecting them to do that. We're, we're setting targets for improvement and expecting them to work better over time, improve how they do their work. And uh, as we do that, we are making the money go farther. By what we're, what we're doing, though, is we're cutting the waste. We're cutting the things that are preventing us from making progress rather than cutting the value that we're actually adding to communities who are in crisis. So to uh, summarize very briefly, lean does help us to rethink our humanitarian aid and to make it better. Thank you. So thanks, Andrew. I just want to remind the audience here in the room and also out in cyberspace that um, after my last presentation, we will go over to a panel discussion and we encourage you to submit your questions to us because I realize this is very complex material and that it's not, we cannot explain all the details um, in the presentations itself. So we encourage you to ask focused questions. Um, but we're definitely seeing after the first two presentations that there is great potential and, and uh, projects have had success in applying evidence-based uh, scientific methods to what we call the work of the heart when we think of, of helping people and uh, humanitarian aid, um, uh, a great deal of, of resources, but also a great deal of good intentions are being poured into this system that has become an economy of its own. But uh, we believe that scientific methods can serve um, to make good intentions uh, go further. So let me provide a last uh, example from our own humanitarian operations and supply chain management lab at ETH Zurich. Uh, we have multiple projects running uh, right now, not all of them um, I can share with you. I'm, I'm glad to share more, but I'd like to, again, uh, show you um, sort of our intermediate results from a running project that is uh, about a topic that is affecting all of our lives right now, and that is the work we're doing uh, with the Ministry of Health in Uganda um, to improve logistics preparedness for disease outbreaks in that country. And uh, I... Uh, what many of us don't know and what scientific uh, evidence-based methods do reveal. Uh, we can look at a system and we think we understand it, but we don't. But logistics uh, as a function in humanitarian organizations can consume up to 80% of budget. So the budgets that I showed you that are now running in the billions of dollars 
um, you know, there's if 80% of those are logistics and, and the logistics is not working well, the money is not going as far as it can, and it's really not about corruption or overhead. Those are two myths we'd like to address later, um, but there's potential for improvement to make the processes work better, uh, make the resources go further. Um, this is why we are paying attention to this and putting all of the resources, the, the brain resources of our ETH lab behind it. So the problem we are addressing there is something very specific to this country. Um, because of its geographic location, because of the, the conditions in that country, um, mostly the proximity of human po populations um, uh, living uh, near animal populations, also the mig migratory patterns of birds. Um, there's a great deal of zoonotic, zo zoonotic um, disease development. Those are uh, pathogens that develop, that become dangerous uh, infectious diseases by spreading from animal to human. And we were asked, and, and um, this country copes, without many of us knowing this, copes quite heroically um, with a list of 10, uh, we just looked at a list of around 10 re diseases that occur regularly. They know it will happen, it will, it will break out, they just don't know when and where, but it's coming. And I'm showing you a few examples here, Ebola, scary, uh, and, but the others are just as scary, Crimean, Congo, hemorrhagic fever, malaria, um, cholera, and now, of course, COVID-19. Um, these outbreaks tend to occur in remote locations with uh, poor infrastructure. They also come in from the bad neighbors um, that Uganda has, um, uh, South Sudan, Congo, and so on, these extremely um, poverty-stricken uh, conflict regions. So these are remote locations, as I said, makes the work very difficult. So their question is a natural one. How much me material, meaning medical supply, should be prepositioned in which location to optimize uh, uh, outcomes for patients. By, by the way, this is a question that every single health ministry in the world is asking themselves today. Um, but this is, uh, this is a challenge to um, the authorities in Uganda every single day for us. It's, it's new um, in its urgency. So this is a question we approached with our scientific method, and the urgency could not be greater um, you know, if Ebola outbreak if it breaks out in Uganda and spreads from the border to the city, um, it will be uh, it will have disastrous con consequences for 45 million people in the country. And should it spread beyond the borders, it might um, affect us as well. So uh, we have had very good uh, experiences in uh, in using scientific methods. Uh, to work on this problem, and not just medically, but really logistics methods, which is what we do at our lab. So our um, uh, humanitarian operations and supply chain management lab began working with the Ministry of Health there in 2019 already um, in the, uh, on the Ebola response. That was our first encounter, and we had very positive experiences with that. It was also about what, what um, Leah has been studying um, from the psychological side. Uh, it was also about collaboration of multiple organizations trying uh, to respond together. Um, and then in uh, 2021, our project uh, was looking at basically all the whole list of diseases uh, together with the ministry. It's a close partnership now. We conducted in this year, we just completed a comp comprehensive baseline study where we exactly measured what, what is not working out right now. You know, so we just don't, you know, the tend um, to believe you can go into a problem set like this and have good uh, performance without a plan is simply naive. We know that that is not true in any other situation, and still it tends to happen in a humanitarian situation because it's urgent, let's just go out and do, there, do that. Um, the scientific method says do a baseline first. We confirmed uh, a, something very specific that, that would only have been possible uh, the, uh, because of the research that we do at our chair at ETH is that the regular healthcare supply chain, which otherwise performs well, does not fit the emergency needs. It, you need a specific supply chain for that. And this creates uh, not only underperformance in the supply of medical goods for in this extremely critical situation, it creates terrible stress for healthcare workers and the ministry. Um, so they have already realized that a decentralization of material storage would accelerate response, but now they have evidence. So they're replacing opinions and power struggles with uh, evidence uh, that is impersonal and you know, uh, something that, that uh, speaks for itself. And what we have definitely uncovered is that the, um, the system there has existing assets, infrastructure, and expertise, um, which... Uh, 
which is which is a huge advantage and the, it's not just um, uh, a situation with with uh, weaknesses but there are great strengths uh, that should be measured and put into place to make um, the, the resources that they have uh, go further. So I will just uh, give you a quick summary of what we're doing next after the baseline study. We're in the, in the midst of the solution search right now and we are um, uh, computing my colleagues. Uh, I have several uh, sub teams working on this. Um, we are creating a mathematical m uh, model to answer the question, how much, where, how much to store and where, and uh, in order to have the, the best possible preparedness for an outbreak based on historical data or just based on where we expect uh, the need will occur. Um, and this is a fairly complex calculation. It can't be done by themselves. They don't have, uh, you know, this is, this is um, support that we can provide from the university. Um, in the same spirit of, of uh, applying the methods also that, that Andrew has just described so far, we are working on process improvements to design the emergency response system um, in addition to their regular health care to say, okay, what do you do when it's really an emergency um, so it works, uh, so it's faster. And, uh, and uh, for example, that PPE, meaning personal protective equipment, is not ransacked by regular hospitals. If someone takes out gloves to deliver a baby, obviously that kit will not be really uh, very useful then for, for isolating um, an evil patient and so on. So these, these are very, very simple things, as Andrew said, but small incremental improvements, when they add up, uh, make a huge difference in performance. So uh, we're working on that too, on their, their processes, and of course, um, um, uh, all sorts of analytics to, to make, including uh, uh, interviews and focus groups, which are more an interactive uh, forms of solution search, to make best use of their resources. And these resources include the people, the medical supply and the finance. And what we're discovering is that if we just improve the way the people work together, you can take very little financial resources and make it go very far. Um, and so this is what uh, I'd like to share with you. Um, what we are confident will happen out of this project is that we will be able to spread best, share best practices from Uganda to the rest of the world. Um, because, as I said, they are doing a heroic job there uh, with uh, very little. And, uh, you know, the pandemic has shown that our own ministries of health and CDCs um, have not been very, very efficient in the response that we have had enormously wasteful um, um, COVID responses. And so um, I hope this was interesting to you. I would like to, uh, to uh, move on to the panel discussion. Uh, we're going to sit down together and uh, answer your questions and, and, and have a discussion to make this a little more detailed for you. So. Do we have, uh, I, do we already have questions from, from the audience? Yes, hello. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and insights uh, into this matter. Quite a lot, quite a lot of it was was new to me. Uh, thanks very much for that. Um, you addressed the the, the people factor, the, uh, all three of you. Um, but is there also a technological development you would crave for? I'd be interested to, to hear from all three of you. Are there certain technological developments, maybe future developments, but certain developments that would aid your particular world uh, work um, uh, on, uh, in the countries of need or in the regions of need or in a more general sense for logistics, for example? So is, are there technological um, assets or new new developments new tools new methods new toys machines uh, that that could aid your particular work the future do you want to take that <laughs> well i'll try one um i mean if there's a technology to get people to be kinder to each other that would be a great place to start <laughs> Um, transportation is one of the primary challenges that we have. So getting goods from one place to another, getting people for, the, for that matter from one place to another as well. Uh, the communication infrastructure also is a big challenge to us. So why, you know, internet capabilities, uh, those types of things. Um, medical, 
obviously if there were medical developments that would, and I know they're being made progress um, even now in you know, a vaccine or something to prevent malaria, those types of things which would get rid of waterborne, help us reduce waterborne diseases, that's a primary challenge. So um, I don't know if there's one silver bullet that comes to my mind, uh, but there are a variety of things that we definitely would benefit from the greater technological advancements as well. I would add to that that I resist um, the temptation to look for a silver bullet. And um, a, a technology is a tool. If it is not used, and this is something we know from the pro for profit sector, we know from industry, and we know this from um, almost every other context. Um, you know, if we have toys uh, and we don't use them and we don't implement them, the value will be zero and the investment you put into that asset is zero. So we dream of IT systems, we dream of, dream of drones, uh, with the exception of medical breakthroughs. Okay, a vaccine, we will always need, uh, you know, better forms of water purification and things like, absolutely. Uh, but certainly from our logistics background, what we're seeing is, is um, you know, if people, uh, w if we have processes that work better, and we often don't even have visibility of the whole process, but if we could just see where they break down, where are the bottlenecks? Um, where, where does the communication stop? Uh, where, uh, uh, yes, where, where do we lack the understanding? Where do we lack the, the information we need to make a good decision? Um, so if we could just cl make the system better that way, um, it's, we're seeing excellent results with low tech. And what, what we saw in our, our, our uh, uh, Beirut case study is that, and, and just now, this I think it was this morning or yesterday, this week, I had a, I had a focus group uh, uh, with Uganda, and they were saying, you know, Bublu, we have WhatsApp, <laughs> and we organized the last mile distribution with WhatsApp. And our, our Beirut case study said, you know, things are changing so fast on the ground, and everything's destroyed. They can't dial into some big fancy IT system that might be set up in Switzerland, they're using their phones, they're using cheap, fast, easy technology that everyone can intuitively use without training. That's what we need. We don't need, you know, putting a drone, plopping a drone into an office does not solve anything. We have to have a process that turns that, the use of that drone into, re, you know, actually, uh, creating more material availability in a certain place. And that's like a, a multifunctional, cross-functional um, uh, task. So um, please, let's stop. And this is true of all of us. Let's not think about silver bullets. Let's think about the system. If I may add something to that, especially in regard to communication. I mean, it's quite obvious that there are so many technologies, communication technologies out there and platforms where humanitarian aid workers can exchange information with each other. And that is very quick information. So where, wherever they are, they can quickly capture this information, whether it be if they take a photo, for instance, or writing a message, and they can upload it, for instance, to social media or to a WhatsApp group. So I think one of the challenges here, again, is of having so many technologies, which is, of course, on the one hand, an asset. On the other hand, though, there need to be authorized people also that filter this information and that, again, provide an infrastructure for this communication exchange, perhaps bringing all these information again together in a platform and making it available. It's, it's extremely challenging also to distinguish reliable information from unreliable information. So that as um, one insight that I also retrieved from, um, from cluster meetings where this is highly discussed and where people are in charge information office, um, offices in order to filter um, these information that come in via technology. So um, in regard to technical innovation, so it's, it's great to have it and to have this exchange, but it also needs then some, so the challenge is to establish or to structure it again. So. There are two questions here from cyberspace. Uh, there's one that, that I can answer very quickly at the top and the second one I'll pass on to you. Andrew, the first one is, I don't know if you can see it, no, you can't. Do uh, international um, humanitarian organizations and agencies have logistics or supply chain experts on their payroll? 
If not, why not? The answer is they do. <laughs> and uh, so that simply exists. We, we've, we're seeing also in the past, uh, Leah, help me, but definitely the past 10 to 20 years, a professionalization of logistics in the sector. And we're seeing very mature and sophisticated and, and brilliant managers uh, dedicating their lives to making this better. That, that has definitely, and, and the simple, simply the existence of the logistics cluster pays tribute to that. So yes, there's specific know-how being built up there and organizational uh, roles yeah. uh, made for that. So yes, that exists. And some of them are coming from the corporate sector. And too. some are coming from the corporate sector too. Mm -hmm. So um, the other question I think is very interesting, uh, very controversial question straight out of the media today. It comes from yes. Deepak. And he says, lean has been criticized during the COVID pandemic when there were stockouts. Just in time was considered, the, was given the blame as the factor for low stocks. How can we tackle these issues, Andrew? Is this a, is this a solution or is this the problem? Well, I know you can talk about this one also. Maybe you have something to add uh, to what I say. Um, so lean helps an organization become more flexible, more adaptable, more able to respond quickly to shocks to the system. And certainly COVID-19 restrictions are a huge shock to the system. Um, yes, uh, the goal is to reduce your, your inventory in order to make, again, make the organization more efficient. If, if an organization is ready and able to respond to shocks, then they will be able to respond to, 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 to COVID-19. So um, it's made organizations more flexible. The thing is having a supplier in China um, a long ways away is actually not a terribly lean thing to do. So uh, rather having, uh, the supply chain closer to you. So if you look at Toyota and where, where do most of the parts, uh, parts suppliers uh, in, the to in the Toyota factory, uh, are, where are they located? They're mostly located around the actual factory itself. So th they're actually practicing what, they, what they're preaching. They also have strategic stocks, which is something that's not talked about so much here. There are strategic stocks that, that the companies do have in order to address the potential crises that may, that may occur. And those, um, those will then help them through. But if, if you can quickly start up somewhere else, another supplier closer by, because you know what the design of the part is, you know how to produce it, and you can get another another vendor up and running quickly, that is going to make you more flexible and not so liable to uh, stockouts. But Uva, maybe you have a couple of cents to add on that one too. Actually, this is, this is something I've been, I've been trying to explain to, to many people uh, during this crisis, and I'm always outraged by, by the media coverage that says that you know, all companies uh, in the world have become too lean, and that's why we don't have uh, toilet paper for three hours um, in the supermarket this week. Um, I think lean should never be taken literally uh, as, as, say, as being the equivalent of having no stock. <laughs> First of all, not every single supply chain and every single company is different, and, it, and it, as it should be. It should be uh, customized and, and strategically fit to its purpose. Um, lean is not, does not mean no stock. Lean does not mean uh, just in time only. That's one of the tools, but it's not all. Lean is a system of thinking that is about uh, removing waste, about continuous improvement, about orientation to the customer. Lean is not the problem during the pandemic. Lean has definitely been part of the solution because of the methods that were applied by commercial companies. If they, if they hadn't been as agile and lean as they were, um, you know, we would have seen much worse um, uh, problems uh, in, in our civilian life. So I won't go into that further. I do recommend uh, the, the blog posts of my colleague, Professor Netland um, at ETH, where he gives very detailed uh, explanations of this. But I think we'll stick to our humanitarian <laughs> questions here. And, and uh, so these were the two questions that came in from cyberspace. How about, uh, are there any, any other here in the audience? Is there anything else you'd like to know in more detail about some of the work we're doing? Um, good evening. Um, I have a question considering like uh, the finances. Um, it's a matter of fact that um, a, lot, a huge problem is that uh, all the um, donations from the countries are mostly bound to certain projects and the NGOs don't have like um, a lot of access to it or can't decide uh, where to put it. And I wonder how your opinion is, um, how much of an impact has um, changing the internal system considering that? 
changing the which system? The internal system. I um, meaning the <coughs> donation mm -hmm. system. Do you want to take this? I know that there's research at your university. Yes, Le yeah, exactly. My, my supervisor, Maria Mitsu, she's yes. doing research on the type of funding organizations receive and what kind of impact that has on their performance. So, And I think one highly criticized um, type of funding is the earmarked funding. Pegged funding, exactly yes. what you mentioned. Exactly what you mentioned. So where organizations um, receive a specific purpose, they have to, they have to execute um, in regard to that. So they get the money to do something specific with it. And that can be that can be in, in that um, in that regard dis destructive, because very often the organizations may need the money for something else, and they are the ones who may better know what this donation is, is needed for. So actually, what um, what was seen is that that also led to a high amount of waste, right? Yes, so it does. Th that is the problem because they couldn't really use what was donated. I think I can only reiterate this point. The research clearly uh, sh uh, has demonstrated this in, in multiple contexts. It doesn't matter what program it is, it doesn't matter what type of organization, what type of crisis, earmarked funding actually creates waste in general, mm -hmm. and obviously different degrees of waste, um, simply because you, can, um, you cannot predict in advance without understanding the system um, where the need will be greatest. And so, um, you know, a donor, Donors, a, a, a colleague of mine recently said, donors actually reduce the optimal space um, with the best of intentions. And this is where science is so interesting and so revealing. When we, we take our scientific methods, we realize we had the best of intentions. It looked intuitively correct, but we, we create so many unintended consequences. And earmarked funding, I think, comes from lack of trust in the organizations. We believe they are, they are, the organizations are corrupt, or we believe they have way too much o overhead. Um, we're dealing with a lot of myths here that actually um, hold uh, humanitarian work back from its maximum impact. And earmarked funding is, uh, in, in, in all research, shown to be that way. Could give many, many examples, but I won't go into that here. Yeah, and I would say part of the solution to that is for the institutional donors to have the understanding that life, life in the field changes and there are, there are these things that are unpredictable. We don't know how, how things will progress over the year. You know, COVID may strike us and we need to respond to a different crisis than we thought that we originally had or their floods come or, or whatever it is. Um, I mean, in my experience, our donors are as flexible, I mean, try to be quite flexible. Um, they have a certain commitment, you know, they have to be responsible to the taxpayers, the taxpayers give, give, you know, give the money and they say, look, you're going to feed this many people, you're going to try and reduce the incidence of waterborne disease by, by this much, <clears throat> and you know, that's what we work towards. Um, I'll say on the other, on the other hand, um, there, there is a benefit to having a goal, to, you know, something that we're working towards, something hard, because the alternative would be, well, here, just go and do good. Uh, but if we don't have targets, if we don't have specific objectives, um, honestly, maybe we might not spend that as, we might not work as hard as we otherwise might in order to achieve those specific goals. And if, if, you, uh, if you remember the, the chart up front, the unmet need is huge and this, the met need is actually quite small. So even if we're you know, not meeting, we're never going to meet all the unmet need. We're all, always only going to meet a part of it. Um, is that the, you know, the most absolutely most important part? We don't know. Um, you know, we, we try to find that. That's what we try and propose to the institutional donors, and we work on that. And then when things change, we do ask them, can we change this? Can we modify this? And, and when, when COVID came around, we saw that most of the institutional donors were ready, very ready and willing to modify, to say, yes, you can do this. Propose us what you want to do differently. Change your targets. Change how you, your budget proposal, you know, give us a new thing. And most of them were, were quite willing and flexible to, to work with us on that. So um, I think it's not all bad. There are challenges. That, that it creates, but um, there's also some good, some good side of it, that um, having specific objectives and working to achieve those is something that motivates an organization to perform well, in spite of the, uh, the, the crises. We have a question from Cyberspace. 
and it comes from Gaurav. He said, currently, where supply chains are failing as an effective post-pandemic, we're almost done, by the way, we're out of time. Um, it, it, so he says that supply chains are failing in the pandemic. Isn't it the best time to develop chains with partnerships of NGOs and corporates, so public-private partnerships? What is your opinion on that well, panel? So my, yeah. my impression is, at least so what, um, what I'm observing, that more and more partnerships are developing between um, the private and the humanitarian sector. And perhaps that for private companies, it becomes even more difficult to distinguish themselves from humanitarian organizations, because especially in the pandemic, they, they became equally also socially responsible yeah. Yeah. for the public as well as um, for the people working in, in their organization. And they could also see that there is a big need for that transportation asset that they have, like DHL, right? Yeah. So Absolutely. A, a company Absolutely. like that, they, they are massive, they are so, um, and they can help. Um, they are so powerful in that regard in providing aid by providing these assets to, to humanitarian organizations and also to the public. So I think that is a, a very positive trend that we are that we can observe that the sectors are increasingly merging exactly and and maybe to add to that um, you know we what we've gone through in the past two years I think has been an unprecedented experience for us in the rich world that we we ourselves went through a humanitarian crisis that there were rich countries that could not look after their their poor people and their their sick people that there were shortages of PPE in the US and this is and so we suddenly were in the position of the beneficiary and that that private companies like the pharmaceutical companies and the transport companies and the hospitals and so on the the uh, healthcare providers were suddenly in a position to show social uh, responsibility. So I think I, uh, when I looked at that and I compared it to the projects we're doing, we're thinking um, uh, certainly, uh, you know, we could learn a lot from the humanitarian sector. So I just wanted to sort of give them a shout out for the, the remarkable work that they are doing. Don't always get a lot of credit for, but yes, uh, we're going to need uh, more partnership between the two and best practices that go in both directions. We yep. think we have something to teach the poor and the, the weary and those who are disadvantaged, there's a great deal we can learn from the heroic work that they do. Maybe with that, um, Elizabeth, we're out of time. I, I, what a shame. I just have one really important question. It's about science. And it's come from s cyberspace as well, but I had it in my notebook. Can I have permission? And so I asked both of you. Um, so both of you are doing scientific work as super nerds. <laughs> um, and at, and we're all super nerds at Super Nerdy University. So and um, so, how did the 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 people in the field, the practitioners, how did they respond um, to your to your efforts to bring um, science to them? How did they? What are the, the the question is what are the barriers for for implementing and for adoption of these best practices mm -hmm. from industry and from science? What are your experiences? Sure. Um, so, in fact, the, um, the thing that brought me to moving to uh, Kenya, I lived in Kenya for three years working in East Africa, and it was because I shared some of these ideas with the actual people who were doing the work. This was back when I was in World Vision. And they said, Andrew, this is new to us. This is exciting. Come and tell us about this. Teach us how to do these things that you're talking about. They were actually eager. So the, <clears throat> there, was, there was genuine interest, and when, w w my favorite thing is when I teach, train someone, give them, the, you know, the light bulb goes on, so to speak, and they are thinking scientifically about their work. They are applying, you know, plan, do, check, act. They're making their work better, and they're sharing that with, with others. Um, the, the barrier is rather the organization has s too many good things that they want to do. And when the leaders don't know about lean, about the scientific approach, and they comply what they're doing in the field inside, um, then it just g it gets delegated, it gets deprioritized, and it doesn't really make the progress. So it's, it's the people are themselves get excited about it, they want to do it, but the organization needs to buy into it, commit to it, and, and make, make it happen. Leah. Well, so during my projects, especially during the cluster study, we were in close contact always with um, the cluster and the people representing the cluster. And we were always showing them also our nerdy stuff, like the computer simulation. And we were showing them, okay, see, th this is the meeting, and these are the agents, and this is how they interact. And they were like, wow, 
okay, so it raised their awareness in regard to this human element and leadership and how fine nuances, like fine changes in leadership, can actually change operations outcome. So that was the first um, experience. And then the second was, so after the paper was written up, I also shared it with um, my study participants, so with the people I talked to um, in the beginning of my study. So I shared the study, and the first feedback was like, wow, do this more often, you researchers, scientists, because we're sharing information with you. We're really curious in order to hear what you make of it, so to what results you get. So that was, um, I think, first um, an important imperative for all the scientists out there, that we should share also the work with our study participants. And then the second was, well, um, that we made something tangible for them, that we provided them with an empirical evidence which was really hard to describe for them. So these emotional power struggles, so this, um, there's also this um, tension between the cluster lead and the cluster members. So they then said, well, who, now we can use it as an empirical evidence to address these issues in our teams. So, and that was, um, a nice, a nice feedback for us as scientists, and um, um, but also highlights the importance um, to, to share to share these results with our with um, with the study participants and practitioners. So thank you, then, and thank you for joining us today. Um, and we invite you to to contact us um, certainly at the ETH Humanitarian Operations and Supply Chain Lab. Um, it's uh, on our website, and uh, you know there are a lot more details about the work that we're doing. So please, uh, you know, we're, we look forward to sharing more as we move forward. It's a very growing field, by all means. So we hope it was interesting to you. <laughs>